champions! We're NBA champions! Okay. Let me set this up for you. I've been a fan of the Denver Nuggets basketball team for a very long time. And you might be asking, Maxwell, how are you a Denver Nuggets fan? Aren't you from Charlotte, North Carolina? Well, how would you be patient for one f***ing second? Basically, on this day, I was born in Denver, Colorado, and lived there for my first seven years. So pretty much all my allegiances are towards teams from Colorado, except for football, because I got into that sport in 2010. And yes, I know, the greedy, evil mustache man owns two teams in Colorado. I know. But for the first time in the Nuggets' 47-year history, they finally reached the NBA Finals. And I wanted to witness history possibly happen in front of me for the team I've been a fan for for more than a decade. So when the Nuggets needed just one more game to win the championship, I bought myself a flight to Denver and got myself a ticket to the NBA Finals. Now before I go further into this video, I need to quickly cover the costs of this impulse decision. So a big thank you to our sponsor of today's video, Raid Shadow Legends. The floor is yours, Professor Death Knight. Professor Death Knight here from Teleria University, who legally not a school, with a math problem. If you create a hit mobile game in 2019, how many champions will you have now? Over 700! Not only does Raid have hundreds of rad champions, it also has 15 amazing factions. Faction Pop Quiz, can you name the latest faction? If you said the elusive Sylvan Watchers, you're right! Okay class, any questions? Uh, hi, uh, yeah, I, I have a question, Professor. Besides yourself, who is Death Knight's favorite new champion? Alright, if, if I can't say Ultimate Death Knight, then I gotta say Ultimate Death Knight. <laughs> He's my number one boy. I'm not supposed to have favorites, but uh, I do. Uh-huh. And who out of all the new champions has Death Knight become friends with? Well, I'm friends with literally every champion. But my favorite new friend is for sure Pythion. <laughs> you ever been friends with a lizard man? Dude makes a killer quiche. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Professor. Raid Call of the Arbiter is in full swing, and to celebrate this limited series, Raid's adding some of the new characters from the series as champions. The first one is Artak, a mighty orc warlord, and he's available to everyone for free. All you have to do is log into Raid for 7 days between now and July 24th. And if you haven't started playing Raid yet, use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get epic champion Talia and other useful things. But as always, a massive thank you to Raid for sponsoring the channel. Let's get back into the video. Most of you guys are football supporters, I'm well aware of that. Some of you are also Eurovision fans, that was a pleasing surprise. But let me just give you a brief history of the Nuggets journey since 2000. Back in 2002-03, Denver finished with 17 wins and 65 losses. They were the worst team in the Western Conference that year. As a result, Denver had the third pick in the NBA draft and acquired Carmelo Anthony. This was, by the way, a very insane NBA draft. LeBron James was in this, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, also uh, he check himself Kyle Korver. Carmelo was an instant impact, scoring 21 points per game, and the Nuggets made the playoffs for the first time since 1995. Unfortunately, their time in the playoffs didn't last long as Kevin Garnett and the number one seed in Minnesota Timberwolves beat Denver in the first round. Okay, look, I've never in my life tried to really go at you in your suits and stuff. Tonight, I am stressing to you, you take this outfit home, are you burning? The next season had a bit of a shaky start, which resulted in George Carl taking over after 43 games. The head coach did well and led the Nuggets back to a second consecutive playoff appearance, but once again, we lost in the first round. In 2005-06, the team was starting to gel together more with players like Andre Miller and Kenyon Martin putting up great numbers. And then there was center Marcus Camby, who was averaging the most blocks of any player that season. But of course, the main man himself was Carmelo Anthony, who was averaging over 26 points per game. But despite being a third seed, the Nuggets would fall in the first round again. Melo began the 2006-07 season as the best scorer in the league, and the newly acquired J.R. Smith was showing promise. But then, during a game between between the Nuggets and Knicks in December, a massive brawl broke out between the teams in the dying minutes of the game. And this punch from Melo right here was worth a 15 game suspension and a $600,000 fine. A day later after the mayhem, the Nuggets acquired Allen Iverson, who was actually second in the NBA in scoring. Then Melo would return from his suspension in January, play alongside Iverson, and these two would lead us to the playoffs as a sixth seed. But for a fourth straight time, the Nuggets lost in the first round. Thanks to the studs at the backcourt, the Nuggets in the following year won 50 games and recorded a 61% winning percentage, which was enough to see them 
be an eighth seed. 2008-09 saw Allen Iverson be traded in the first week of the season for Colorado's own Chauncey Billups. Throughout the season, the Nuggets trio of Melo, Billups, and J.R. Smith put up fantastic numbers, all the while center Nene had a career high in scoring and rebounds per game. Denver won just four more games than last season, and you want to know where they were seated this time? Second. Finally, though, the Nuggets made it past the first round after beating the Hornets in five games. But the lows were low. I mean, the lows were low during the regular season, and I think that battle tested this group. In the conference semis, again Denver would win in five, this time against the PSYOP owned Dallas Mavericks. But unfortunately, it was the end of the road in the conference finals as the LA Lakers beat Denver in six. The core of the team would remain for the 2009 10 season, and they'd finish as a pretty solid fourth seed. But for the sixth time in seven playoff appearances, the Nuggets would fall in the first round. Then came the 2010-11 season, and it started with speculation of Carmelo Anthony requesting a trade after he had refused to sign an extension. Eventually, he'd be traded to the New York Knicks, as was Chauncey Billups and a few other players. In return, the Nuggets got Wilson Chandler, Danilo Gallinari, Raymond Felton, and Timothy Moskov. In retrospect, I'm not really sure how we finished as a fifth seed that season, but you know, uh, fair enough. From this trade, Denver also got a bunch of draft picks, but we'll get back to that later in this video. In the next season, led by up-and-coming Ty Lawson, the Nuggets appeared in the playoffs as a sixth seed. But just like PSG, you guessed it, another first round exit. Oh yeah, we also drafted the Manimal that season. That was pretty cool. The Nuggets in the 2012-13 season acquired point guard Andre Iguodala, and he was a great addition to the team. Denver finished the season in third, but lost to the six-seeded Golden State Warriors. Ironically enough, Iguodala jumped ship at the end of the season and joined the Warriors. But more of a shocker was George Carl being fired after winning Coach of the Year. 2013-14 was pretty miserable. Led by new coach Brian Shaw, the Nuggets finished 11th and missed out on the playoffs for the first time since 2004. They looked more like chicken nuggets than gold nuggets the following season after a 12th place finish. Yeah, I did it, okay? I did the chicken nugget joke. You happy? You f***ing happy? However, during the season, they traded for Will Barton, who proved to be a decent addition. And during that season's draft, Denver traded for center Yusuf Nurkic and shooting guard Gary Harris. They also acquired in the second round an unknown center from Serbia by the name of Nikola Jokic. Ty Lawson, despite his talent, was starting to become quite the nuisance with his ever-growing list of misdemeanors. So the Nuggets said goodbye to him and sent him to Houston. In his place came newly drafted Emmanuel Moutier from the famous Guangdong Tigers. The organization would also put its trust into a new head coach in Michael Malone. The 2015-16 season wasn't exactly anything pretty in terms of win record, but the rebuild was showing a lot of promise. Will Barton, Emmanuel Moutier, and Gary Harris were all averaging good scoring numbers. And remember Nikola Jokic, the, the random second round pick? Well, he was showing way more promise than people initially thought he had. Then came the 2016-17 season, where the Nuggets would use one of their first round picks they acquired from the Mellow trade to draft point guard Jamal Murray. They'd also draft forward Juancho Hernan Gomez, and shooting guard Malik Beasley. The Nuggets youth movement was starting to make more strides as they just missed out on the playoffs. Gary Harris and Will Barton were both improving their games. Jamal Murray in his rookie season was nearly averaging 10 points off the bench. But more importantly, the Joker himself, Nikola Jokic, was emerging as the player the Nuggets would be building their team around. He could score from any range, rebound on both ends, and had surreal passing abilities unheard of for a center. The Nuggets in 2017-18 made quite a few additions. Power forward Paul Millsap had just come off his best scoring season with Atlanta, and he was signed by Denver, as was defensive specialist Torrey Craig, who before was playing upside-down basketball. And in the draft, the Nuggets got big game Tay himself, Monte Morris. Oh yeah, we also traded away Donovan Mitchell for Trey Lyles, but you know, we, we don't really need to talk. There were a couple departures as well, including Danilo Gallinari, who had been our top scorer for the past few seasons. And then later into the season, Emmanuel Moutier, who just kept declining, was traded to the New York Knicks. The Nuggets looked even better this season, and the young core was improving significantly. We were starting to see somewhat of a new trio form in Jamal Murray, Gary Harris, and Nikola Jokic. Jokic in particular led the team in points per game, rebounds per game, and assists per game. In fact, he was close to averaging a double 
double-double for the season. Unfortunately, Denver would once again miss out on the playoffs after losing to the Timberwolves on the final day. I specifically remember being uh, pretty pissed off and depressed going to bed that night, because I had to witness Will Barton go 2 for 9 from the field in the second half. Before the 18-19 season, the franchise had a slight rebrand and changed the colors. And listen, as much as I love this team, I've only really been able to tolerate this new look. I do like the new tweaked version of the statement uniforms though, and hey, at least our city uniforms are usually bangers. Usually. Going into the draft, shooting forward Michael Porter Jr. was a top prospect, but his back injuries had many teams concerned. Due to this, Denver got very lucky, and Porter fell to them as the 14th pick. MPJ would miss the entire season due to surgery, but there was no doubting that fans would excitedly wait for his debut. This was also the season where I saw my first ever NBA game in person. It was the Hornets vs. the Nuggets in Charlotte. We lost that game. Denver, though, went on to make the playoffs for the first time since 2013. There were great performances from plenty of the players, but the standout ones were from the developing dynamic duo of Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. Blue Arrow himself was averaging 18 points per game and nearly 5 assists per game, while Nikola Jokic had a breakout season, broke records held by legends of the game, and made his first All-Star appearance all in one season. Now even though the Nuggets were a strong second seed, playoff inexperience saw the young team struggle a good amount in the first round. But in the end, the young team prevailed against the Spurs in Game 7, their first series win since 2009. In the conference semis, the Nuggets would have a 3-2 lead in the series versus the third seeded Portland Trailblazers. <laughs> However, Denver were no match for Damian Lillard and Duke basketball's worst nightmare, CJ McCollum, and they lost the series in seven. On to the 2019-20 campaign, and it was a great start. Jamal Murray agreed to an extension, we bolstered up our front court with Jeremy Grant, MPJ finally made his debut, and we finished 2019 with 23 wins and 10 losses. During that time also, I was spending a semester in Colorado for college, so I took the opportunity to use the very little funds I had, and I went to see Boston vs. the Nuggets at my very first Denver home game. Twenty twenty though was a little bit of a struggle, and then we decided to trade away some effective bench players. And listen, if you think I'm going to explain how the rest of this trade works, I don't even know how the f it works. Oh yeah, did I mention it was twenty twenty? Boom, COVID season suspended indefinitely. But then later in August, the NBA returned with the playoffs in the famous bubble. The Nuggets played the Utah Jazz in the first round and went down 3-1 in the series. But then, a little phenomenon called Bubble Murray emerged. In Game 5, Jamal put up 42 points. Game 6 saw him drop 50 without a single free throw to force Game 7. And then the Nuggets would complete the improbable 3-1 comeback. Next was the star-studded LA Clippers, a team that had managed to become more hated than the LA Lakers. That didn't matter too much to the Clippers though, as they took a 3-1 lead in the series. But then, in Game 5, Marcus Morris, acting like a little bitch as per usual, became the turning point of the series. Denver would come back in this game and then come back in the series to advance to the conference finals for the first time since 2009. Ironically enough, we were up against the Lakers again, but instead of Kobe and Gasol, it was LeBron and Anthony Davis. Bubble Murray was still in full swing though, the man was looking like Michael Jordan at times, but it just wasn't enough as the Lakers took a 3-1 lead. However, just like the previous two times, the Nuggets would prevent- The Los Angeles Lakers will take down the Denver Nuggets- Damn it. 2020-21 had quite a shakeup throughout the entire season. We lost Jeremy Grant to the Pistons and Torrey Craig to the Bucks, but then we added power forward Jermichael Green and point guard Facundo Capazzo. However, the most notable change was Denver trading away Gary Harris, who had been on a decline for the talented forward Aaron Gordon. The Nuggets were also in major injury trouble throughout the whole season, but still managed to finish as a third seed. Murray got hit, and this is gonna be Golden State ball. And Murray's down and hurt, oh my goodness. <laughs> Will Barton also got injured, so we practically were screwed in the playoffs. We still managed to beat the Blazers in six, but then the Suns sweeped us. On a positive though, Nikola Jokic won NBA's Most Valuable Player of the Year award. The following season was quite a struggle, mainly because Jamal Murray would be out for the entire season. MPJ also missed most of the season due to a third back surgery. The Nuggets core still did a solid job, but with so many missing pieces, they eventually fell short and lost to the Golden State Warriors in the first round of the playoffs. But hey, at least Jokic won another MVP award. Now we're at the most up-to-date season, 2022-23. The Nuggets started the offseason drafting shooting guard Christian Brown from Kansas. Denver then acquired shooting guard Bruce Brown and veteran slash former resident of Lob City, 
DeAndre Jordan. Finally, they traded away both Will Barton and Monte Morris for shooting guard Kentavious Caldwell Pope. So now, the Nuggets had some exceptional defenders in both Aaron Gordon and KCP. And with both Jamal Murray and MPJ back, the Nuggets would return stronger than ever. At the end of the season, Denver finished with the best record in the conference, and this was after overseeing multiple organizations develop super teams to differing successes. KCP was putting up solid numbers, Aaron Gordon had significantly improved from last season, MPJ and Jamal performed like they had never even left. There was also Brown and Brown Company emerging as this reliable source off the bench. And of course you had Nikola Jokic who was averaging nearly a triple-double for the season. Even more impressive was the fact that he was making, on average, 60% of his shots. But now, those numbers mean nothing. The regular season is over, it's time for the playoffs. First round, it was Minnesota, and Denver conquered with ease in five games. Next was the Suns. Those guys don't really know how to perform when it matters the most. Okay, yes, they had injuries to Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton, but, um... Denver then returned to the conference finals for the second time in three years to play, you guessed it, the Lakers again. But Jamal and Jokic weren't letting 2020 repeat itself. The two both came alive in the series and the Nuggets swept the Lakers. I was in London for games 2-4 to four, by the way, so my sleep schedule, absolutely ruined. But you think I cared? <sighs> Course not. Denver Nuggets, first time in the NBA Finals. Their opponents? The 8th seeded Eastern Conference champions Miami Heat but do not take them lightly. Led by Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, this was a team that consisted of undrafted players turned studs. And no matter the odds, the Heat always had one trick up their sleeve, their fourth quarter runs. Miami were displaying masterclass after masterclass on how to come back from a deficit throughout the entire playoffs. They managed to beat the number one seeded Bucks in the first round, and then in the conference finals, they beat the number two Boston Celtics. However, the Nuggets themselves were finding the right form at the very right time. Jokic and Murray in particular had upped their numbers significantly throughout the playoffs. Jamal was averaging 26 points per game and seven assists per game, while the Joker was putting up insane numbers, 30 points per game, 13 rebounds per game, and almost 10 assists per game. He had also just broken a triple-double record before reaching the finals. The Nuggets took game one in Denver with ease thanks to Jokic registering yet another triple-double and Jamal Murray going off for 26 points. Game two belonged to the Heat after disaster classes from MPJ and KCP and yet another Heat rally back in the fourth quarter. Then game three in Miami saw the Nuggets respond in commanding fashion. Both Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray Murray registered 30 plus point triple doubles. Aaron Gordon played a massive part with an 11 point double double, while Christian Brown off the bench went off in the third quarter scoring 15 points of his own. Game 4, Aaron Gordon comes up big with 27 points. Then, the game was pretty much put to bed by Bruce Brown who came off the bench to score 21 points in 30 minutes. The final score, Denver 108, Miami 95. Denver was now just one game away from winning their first ever championship. So immediately after that win, I knew this was a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I ran to my PC after game four, bought tickets for a flight to Denver, and then bought tickets to game five. I remember after all this, I told my mom and she just gave me the most, what the f are you doing face I've ever seen. Mom, you, you just don't understand. Sorry. But anyways, that was all on a Friday. Game 5 was on Monday. So fast forward to Monday at about 4 a.m. It's dark and also rainy, so I nearly die about five different times trying to even get to the airport. And then I get on my flight at about 7.30 in the morning, and I'm just nervous. Nervous? Yes. First time. No, I've been nervous lots of times. But also, I was experiencing, I don't even know how to really explain this, it was just a never-ending adrenaline. I mean, I would just picture the Nuggets winning the championship in my head, and I, it's, it's all of a sudden my body would just start feeling like it was on cloud nine, like it was on like 10 tons of coffee. I don't even drink coffee! But I arrive in Denver at about 9, and just really have the whole day to myself until about 5.30 when I should be in the arena. So, after finishing episode 23 of Peakland Saga, I just walked up to downtown. That took about 45 minutes. I, I thought it'd take like 10. See, I went to London about two weeks prior, so walking 30 minutes was like nothing 
walking 45 minutes in the States, I completely forgot how absolutely horrible that is. But yeah, I just kind of explored. It was a Monday, so the city was a bit dead, as you would expect on a Monday. I got to see my favorite street mall be extra dead because some dumb f**ks decided to do some renovations and expansion right after COVID. But then, it was nearly game time. And so I went with my friend Brazilian Fury and hung around the outskirts of the arena just to kind of take it all in. But no matter how much I looked at those NBA Finals banners, it just never would wrap around my head the fact that I was there. Oh, also I got this picture with Joaquin Phoenix, uh, so that was cool. About 30 minutes passed, now in the arena, I'm feeling every emotion known to man. Not only did my favorite team have the chance to win a title tonight, I was possibly going to experience that elation in person. There were times when I was in that arena just thinking to myself, what the f am I doing? How am I even here? What the f am I doing here? But being in that arena and seeing above a Nuggets court, a Jumbotron with the NBA Finals logo on it. I mean, it just felt like a dream. Oh yeah, speaking of the Jumbotron, during like a pre-show thing, they had a graphic that showed like what the Nuggets need to do to win the game. I found this pretty funny. But at last, at long last, it was game time. The arena, packed to the brim, full of Nuggets fans of every era who had waited so patiently for a moment that some didn't even believe would ever happen in their lifetime. The atmosphere, so filled with energy, so electrifying it could provide power to the entire city for an eternity. The stage was now set for our men who have made us so proud already to cement themselves as legends of Denver sports. We go again, boys. Nuggets ball. Jamal Murray passes it to MPJ and knees called for a travel. Eventually, after going 5-0 down, the Nuggets finally got things going and were cutting through Miami's defense like they weren't even there. However, Miami responded well and managed to keep it close, taking advantage of the Nuggets' poor shooting. Another thing troubling Denver was Bam Adebayo, who made the paint practically his new home after scoring 14 first quarter points. So after the first quarter, it was Denver 22, Miami 24. Miami started right where they left off and went on a 15-7 run throughout the first 8 minutes of the second quarter to widen the difference to 10 points. But momentum in basketball can shift very quickly, because 2 minutes later the Nuggets rallied back to cut Miami's lead to four. However, immediately point guard Kyle Lowry disrupts the flow with an insane contested three. Jamal and Jokic help the Nuggets catch up, but again, it's Kyle Lowry who comes up with another massive three-pointer. Fast forward, it's about two minutes to go in the quarter, Miami has a seven-point lead. So yeah, you'd think Miami was probably the better team throughout the game, and in some aspects, yes, but not necessarily, because the Heat were only shooting above 42% from the field in the second quarter. Denver had a better percentage in terms of shooting, but the thing was, they just could not take advantage of a single Miami mishap, not one. Now MPJ in particular, for some reason, had a curse put upon him before the final, because he's just not been able to make a single three-pointer, or really a jumper at times. And I guess that curse just decided to spread throughout the rest of the team, because in the first half, the Nuggets attempted 15 three-point shots and made only one. So at halftime, the score was Miami 51, Denver 44, and I was dreading the score. Because for me at least, the stakes were a bit higher than usual. I had gone out of my way to buy a ticket to Denver and the game, and I'm just saying, that definitely was not cheap. And I knew, even if the Nuggets went on to win game six and I'd be celebrating like a maniac, my friends would never let me hear the end of game five. If we lost game five, I would be flying back the biggest clown of 2023 the very next day. These men would have barbecues with me as the fresh meat daily. And after having to witness Arsenal bottle and hear it for months with every second that passes that I live on this planet, I was begging, begging the sports gods for mercy. But anyways, third quarter now. Both teams trade buckets to start off. The Nuggets also got some free throws. Uh, 
Nonetheless, Denver started making some crucial stops and actually started converting them. Then with 6.50 remaining in the quarter, Miami have a bad miss. MPJ collects it and swiftly runs up the court to find Jamal Murray in the corner. Wait, hold on. I've always wanted to do this since I was a kid. Splash. I'd like to formally apologize for that. Tie game for the first time since the first quarter. Miami then come fighting back as they score four points of their own. But then Lowry slips on the next possession, turns it over to KCP. He misses his layup, but Bruce Brown is there to put it in. And then again, Miami turns it over. MPJ takes it, dribbles it between his legs, and finishes it beautifully. Now, 130 left in the quarter. It's tied 66, and MPJ from behind the arc finally puts one in. Denver by three. 14 fires away and knocks it down. Would you off Lowry. Heat 71, Nuggets 70 with one more quarter to go and the crowd at the formerly known Pepsi Center could not be more fired up for this. Denver, please bring this sh home. First possession to Denver and Jamal picks out Jokic for the easy layup. But hold up, let me see some blue f***ing arrow baby. You think I'm done though? MVP, at it again. Lowry, a corner three, cut! I swear to f- It's whatever though. The old man can experience his last bits of happiness before demise because Jokic has entered his final four. Jamal now dishes another, this time the brown, but it's blocked. Now it's Kyle Lowry to terrorize us again, but not this time. Aaron Gordon says, get that sh out my f***ing face. Jamal now does it himself five point game. However, 4.30 to go. Jimmy Butler has finally turned on Himmy Buckets mode. No worries though, KCP neutralizes the threat with his own three. However, again, Himmy Buckets is not taking no for an answer. And with 3.25 to go, he throws up another three. It misses, but a foul is called. Okay, this is definitely getting called back. He literally kicks out of Gordon. The call on the floor stands. What? Three free throws made later. Now Butler attacks the paint and gives Miami the lead with 2.47 to go. Next possession, Nikola Jokic misses match with someone who could have been mistaken for a Leeds United player in 2019-20 and he gives Denver the lead back. Miami possession now. Butler's fouled, two free throws made, Miami up again. But now, Jamal Murray for the Nuggets. Go on, Jamal. Go, Jamal. Oh, yes! Less than a minute to go now. Nuggets with this possession could put the game to bed here. Back him down. Ah, oh, oh, gosh. Ain't hey, no way, ain't no way, ain't no way. Defense! 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 Defense. Jimmy Butler on the drive, gets inside, stops. Stolen by yeah. Caldwell Pollock! The Nuggets had been awful all game with free throws, but KCP didn't care about that as he buried both free throws. And then finally, Bliss. It's over! At last, the long wait is over! After 47 years, the Denver Nuggets can finally call themselves NBA champions! <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
If I know you guys, oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. 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 don't hurt nobody. So as of this recording, it's been about a week since all of this happened, and I truly can't believe it still. And now that we've won the title, it feels even more surreal that I've been a part of this 7-8 to eight year journey of a rebuild. I mean, seeing Nikola Jokic and Jamal Murray evolve as the players they are now today, it's just been, it's been a joy. And while Jokic has exploded on the scene, Jamal Murray has slowly inched towards where he is now. And I knew he would, he just has a certain aura to him. And another thing I've really loved about this team is the fact that despite all the hardships and everything, they always take it on as a family. And Michael Malone deserves all the credit for creating this wonderful culture. I mean, you can put up as many super teams as possible, but if you're just ego and that, you're not winning championships. And now both the Bucks and Nuggets have proven that. Genuinely though, seeing in person the Nuggets win their first championship has to go down as one of the greatest nights of my life. And just like hitting 100k, this was a special moment that no one can ever take away from me. It's one that within that once in a lifetime narrative is filled with even more stories of hardships and success that led to that very moment. And an even greater thing about these types of stories are the people behind it. Because I mean this from the bottom of my heart. If it wasn't for any of you guys, none of these moments would have been possible. And on that, I'll end the video here. I know this video is definitely not going to do well, and honestly, I, I couldn't care less. But if you did end up clicking on this video and ended up reaching the end of this video, then, I mean, a big thank you to you. Big, big thank you. And of course, a massive shout out to all our patrons, including Stin, Janos Baras, Chris Damaseno, Miliwe009, Aldipu, Alex Rod, Olta, Min Suomez, Aresan, Carlos Anaya, Daniel Ortiz, Francisco Hernandez, Guy, Joao Cavallo, Marco Fujimoto, Miguel Munoz, Return Fire, Rivera Drawing, Rory Burns, Saw, Slider Kit, Sniffers, Takaoka Fan, The Motor Drive, Tomicus, Vanilla Mexican 17, Victor, Bubble, Chris Visconti, Q Snidey Champs 2022, Dominic Griffin, Emmett Shea, Lewis, Joe Paricio, Lucien von Kreuz, Michael Nista, MX Weeb, Niche, Patrick Barley, Phil Bacchus, Sylvia Citrus, and Unbroken Persona. If you'd like to join the Patreon, there'll be a link down below and up in the annotations. You can follow my Twitter if you want, follow my Instagram if you like, follow my TikTok, trying to get to 20,000 there, and of course, you can follow my semi-active Twitch. And we just hit 10,000 followers on that, so thank you very much for that. But until then, I'll see you guys.